Morning, everyone. And um, my name is Badrinath. I would like to welcome you on behalf of uh, Prayer Earth Industry Association, RIA, for this uh, third uh, LCA webinar and workshop session on life cycle uh, assessment on rare earths. So I would like to introduce the speakers as well as the agenda, along with uh, a short introduction about RIA, why we are and uh, who we are and what we are going to do for the industry. And uh, this is an industrial association on a global level founded in June 2019 in Brussels. And we started with uh, a very few members that is around something like 11 in 2019. And today we are 32 to 35 members and uh, covering all the segments of rare earth value chain. And why we are existing, why we need a industrial association we need to address the various aspects related towards the economical perspectives and environmental perspectives. Rarers has a pretty good advantage towards the applications with, for the energy efficiency, as well as some critical applications, which are very important. And in these circumstances, this is the only critical materials which doesn't have any association and there is a huge gap between the upstream players and the downstream players and every time the downstream players are focusing towards the cost perspectives ignoring all other perspectives related towards the communication collaboration in bringing in the environmental perspectives as well as the economical and social perspectives and uh, it's also very important point that actually we don't have factual data and comprehension that is one of the pillar, major pillar for bringing in the transparency and sustainability. And RIA would like to bring a sustainability standard, which is unified, integrating the transparency perspectives along the value chain. So that's the reason RIA has been established and it is supported by the EIT Foundation, by the European Commission and the industrial players. So the rare why, as I mentioned, why we exist, we also have some challenges within the industry, which we would like to address. The negative perception of rare earths, some of the industries, uh, some of the manufacturers are directly publicizing that actually we don't want to use rare earths because rare earths has, are not environmentally friendly or produced in environmental friendly processes. So we would like to bring in much more information that is correct and which is not misinformation. And we would like to bring in the value proposition with respect to the potential applications as well as and the processing aspects. So we would also like, we know that there is a dark past, the upstream industry with, with regards to the sustainability and social responsibilities as majority of the production is at certain one place. So we would like to bring in that these things are not happening and how these things can be addressed and can be solved instead of just shifting the problem from one end to another end. So the rare earths are considered as also a geopolitical and economic weapon. So we would like to see actually how we can handle this. And price dominance over sustainability and transparency is also one of the biggest challenge which we have. Some of the applications are hampered by non-existence of certification and sustainability standards, which some industrial players are openly telling that there doesn't exist any certification or sustainability standard. So we would don't want to up adopt these materials in our products. Concerning about the supply risks, again, when there is no transparency with respect to the price and competition, so we do have supply risks. And also reputational risks. Some industries want to have keep their reputation, not by just destroying it by their materials that are not sustainably produced. So with all this, RIA has made a vision that we would like to bring in a sustainable responsible and collaborative along with the transparent rare earth value chains from mine to recycled sources, thus by maximizing the potential of these materials and their applications. With this vision, we would like to have a strong foundation towards the sustainability. And then we would like to build on a mission from the vision what we have uh, planned in. So we would like to develop a strong and balanced global stakeholder network so that we have an open dialogue between the upstream and the downstream players along the value chain that supports the sustainable value chains. And it also creates the transparency and also brings in a unified certification process within the re-industry, rare earth industry. And it also supports 
the economical and sustainability potentials with respect to these materials and also promotes collaboration. So these are all the various things, bringing in the three pillars, which is research and analysis and stakeholder network and strategic solutions. That has a huge influence in bringing in the transparency and the sustainability. When I talk about this transparency and sustainability, it is very important that actually life cycle assessment and the inventory needed should be authenticated and it should have the realistic data, not the generic data. So then the exact facts will be coming out. So with all this, I would like to conclude what RIA is and why we are promoting life cycle assessments and in the field of products and why we are conducting these webinars in order to bring in the awareness within the industry on these materials. So we have a very attractive agenda with the three speakers from different uh, regions. One from the first speaker, Lisa Bolin from Polestar, where they have recently released a LCA document with their comparisons. And it would be nice to see their perspectives and listen how they have carried out the journey and see how they will be looking at. And then Professor Wong from the country China, where they will be producing the majority of the products. So it would be very nice to see how they are looking at the sustainability and how they are utilizing life cycle assessments. And also from Japan, Dr. Morimoto, looking at how the substance flows and analysis of products and how it is going to be contributing towards the international standards. And I have a very good experience working with him directly. So it will be very interesting to see his perspectives. With this, I would like to conclude and I would like to hand over the stage to the first speaker, Lisa Bullin from Polestar. Thank you very much and enjoy the webinar. My name is uh, Lisa Bullin and uh, I work at Polestar uh, at the headquarters in Sweden. Uh, I am working as clim climate lead at Polestar. So I am responsible for well, climate related <laughs> uh, challenges and also I have um, worked a lot with life cycle assessment uh, the last year. Um, so the title of my uh, presentation is uh, Pushing the Industry Towards Transparency. I would like to say that my presentation is not focused on rare earth, but, but more, more on uh, life cycle assessment in general and how we carried out the life cycle assessment on Polestar 2. Uh, first, I wanted to say something about Polestar. I'm not sure if everyone uh, are um, familiar with the company. Uh, we, are a, uh, we are an electric vehicle company. We're developing and uh, selling electric cars. Um, and uh, we have three words that uh, kind of define everything we do. Pure, progressive and performance. Uh, and um, pure um, is... Well, I think that in the beginning, Pure was mostly focusing on design. Our cars have a very pure and quite minimalistic uh, avant-garde design, and they are quite recognizable. Um, and we, our CEO is a designer, which is not maybe the uh, case for most um, uh, car companies. Uh, pure is also about sustainability, of course. Um, and we are uh, focusing a lot on being transparent and uh, trying to address the impact that we know that our products have, which uh, this presentation will uh, get back to, uh, of course. Uh, our, um, um, we try to be progressive and innovative in the technology we use. Uh, and uh, we always want to be on the front line and have the best uh, new technology, of course. Um, so that's um, the progressive part. Uh, when we talk about performance, it's of course both about the performance of the car, which I mean, Polestar, uh, Polestar cars are not uh, just taking you from one place to another. It's uh, experience to drive them. And uh, our customers uh, really appreciate um, the experience of driving the car, the experience of um, the whole um, journey, you can say, with Polestar, we have Android uh, in our car, so that uh, it's easy for you to use the car as well as you use your phone or um, uh, your uh, Google Assistant at home or uh, whatever it is. 
Um, I'm not going to go into more detail about our products and so on. If you want to know about it, you can uh, find it on our, on our web page. Uh, so this presentation is about life cycle assessment, of course. Um, and this is something that we have committed to our customers to do for our um, uh, products. We have said we are going to release a life cycle assessment for every product we uh, set on the market. Uh, we have uh, four main topics that we uh, work on when it comes to sustainability. They are very similar to many other companies, I think. Climate neutrality, circularity, transparency and inclusion. And I mean, life cycle assessment actually um, have relations to all of those uh, words. Um, uh, climate neutrality, of course, but also inclusion when it comes to include our suppliers in the journey of getting more and better data for our uh, life cycle assessments. Transparency to be transparent about methodology and so on. And circularity, of course, uh, is also important. Um, we realized when we started working with life cycle assessment at Polestar that there is a lack of transparency on how life cycle assessment and carbon footprints are calculated. We have focused on carbon footprints. I would, say, I, I would like to stress that. I mean, we are not looking into all different environmental impacts. Um, and, but we also knew that if our customers or stakeholders want to really understand what the climate impact is of, of our cars, we need to present them more than just a figure uh, or a result of a carbon footprint. Um, and that in combination with that there is already a bit of lack of trust in the car industry or the vehicle industry uh, due to past events of uh, diesel gate and um, <laughs> similar things. Uh, we thought that uh, if we are not transparent about uh, how we uh, do our life cycle assessment, this will hold us back and we think that it could even make the trust in the industry even um, lower. And as you know, this is some headlines that I've just cut out from uh, different newspapers like Washington Post, New York Times, Guardian and so on. It's almost every day report on climate impact from electric vehicles and they are many times uh, contradictionary so sometimes you read uh, uh, the electric cars are better than uh, than uh, combustion engines sometimes they're not uh, there are conflicting reports um, and this of course um, uh, creates a lot of confusion around electric vehicles and I'm not blaming any journalist or um, public, uh, <laughs> the public for this. We need to work in the industry to be more open about our, um, for example, carbon footprints and how, what impact we actually have. Um, as I said, this, all of this, the, um, the reports in media on uh, uh, that are saying different things and the fact that we saw that very few car manufacturers are actually presenting their methodologies to uh, do a life cycle assessment or a carbon footprint. Uh, all of that made us um, take the step to say okay we are going to publish the full methodology of our carbon footprint uh, and not only the results. And um, that you can find on our uh, web page. Uh, there is also a link in the presentation that I think you will, uh, you, so you can uh, find that when you get the presentation. Um, and another reason, we want to provide our customers and uh, everyone in the public with this information, of course, but it's also a call to other car makers to do the same because, of course, for us, it would be um, good if we can come to some kind of uh, agreements on how to um, different methodology choices in uh, carbon footprints and LCA uh, to, for our customers to be able to compare between different cars. I mean, in the end, maybe a standard 
uh, as we have seen in other industries, um, so that it's not only different figures that are not comparable. Um, of course, we have made an LCA, and you can find it on our web page. Uh, but of course, we don't. We not. We're not only evaluating the products that we already have. Um, we also use life cycle assessment in our projects, of course. Um, and developing a car takes a lot of time. Um, from the point that uh, someone, of course, there's a lot of research, like general uh, research and development in the beginning. But then when you decide now this project is, is going on and we are going to produce this car, it takes about three years until the first car is produced. So uh, we cannot wait. <laughs> we have to be involved in that process uh, uh, in order to make any changes. For, because, of course, doing carbon footprints of our products, the main goal is, also, is uh, to improve and to make things better. So uh, the things that we use LCA for is to keep track um, that our products are um, in line with our climate ambitions, and that is to become climate neutral. Uh, evaluate our suppliers um, on the basis of carbon footprint. Uh, work together with them to improve. Uh, choices between different materials, find hotspots of course, and um, also to give feedback to design and engineering on how can they create the product that is easy to repair or maybe with more modularity so that you can um, have a better end of life scenario for the products. So that's something about how we work with LCA. I will now go into more detail about the LCA or the carbon footprint of Polestar 2 and how we did that. So Polestar 2, I didn't mention so much about our cars, but it can be good for me to say something. It's a full electric uh, car. Uh, it has two electric motors uh, and a battery of 78 kilowatt hours. Um, yeah, it uh, weighs about uh, two metric tons. Um, th I think that's some information that can be <laughs> good to have. Um, yeah, and um, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with life cycle assessment, but I will go through this anyway if someone is um, feeling a little bit rusty on their, on their um, knowledge about the LCA. <laughs> uh, so in uh, life cycle assessment, we of course look at the whole life cycle uh, and we start from the raw material, the, um, the mining, the extraction of different uh, minerals and um, uh, oil and gas from the earth. And uh, we, we take into account all the manufacturing processes until there is a component or a fuel that is used in our car or in our uh, production plants. Um, of course, also we take into account the use phase of the car. Um, and that I will come back to that. Um, and uh, after the car is uh, used and scrapped, we take into account end of life and what happens to the materials uh, when they are scrapped and uh, yeah, different scenarios for recycling or um, yeah, waste management. We follow the ISO standard, but the ISO standard of course is very vague in what methodology choices you're supposed to make. So that is one of the reasons why there are so many different methodologies used out there to uh, do a life cycle assessment of vehicles and also uh, it gives so it, it doesn't really give any detailed instructions for you when it comes to methodology choices. A little bit about cars in general uh, like I said it takes a long time to develop the car and the car also have a lot of uh, components so it's a very complex product uh, it's very time consuming and therefore we need to find met uh, methodologies uh, to simplify um, <laughs> the way we, we do the um, carbon footprint because we can't follow every component back to its source, it's just not possible. And uh, there's a lot of suppliers of course, uh, several hundred suppliers I would say. Um, 
and many articles are both ready-made, so it's not the we are not buying uh, chunks of aluminium or steel um, in most cases, but they are uh, already ready-made articles, so there has to be a lot of communication with suppliers. Okay, as you all know, system boundary is a very important thing in LCA. Um, so what we include in um, this picture is a little bit uh, <laughs> messy, but I hope that you can follow. Um, what we include in this um, um, study is, of course, all the raw materials going into the car, as you can see to the left in the picture. And uh, the darker square uh, in this picture, uh, it represents the data that we get from our own operations. So the inbound transport from tier one to our manufacturing site, uh, the manufacturing site, of course, uh, the outbound um, transport to the uh, customer and also the use phase uh, we get data from uh, internally end of life is also included like I said before and what we looked at in this uh, LCA it was only greenhouse gas emissions so it's a carbon footprint um, the functional unit we used was uh, a post-star vehicle driving 200,000 kilometers and um, uh, we are uh, uh, presenting this in CO2 equivalents. Like I said, the methodology is, um, has to be uh, optimized in a way because uh, the car is so complex. And uh, I'm not sure what backgrounds you guys have, but for all the components in a car, the supplier has to um, give us a data sheet that uh, declares what materials are included in the component and um, those are used um, to, to uh, do the life cycle assessment. So what we actually do is that we take those data sheets and we match them with the bill of material of the car so that every component has a data sheet. And then we have an um, application you can say that uh, go into the data sheets and sort all the materials. So a data sheet might have aluminium, steel and other materials. And this application sort all the materials into material categories. We have about 70, 80 material categories. Um, and um, so what we end up is, um, you can say a new bill of material, but with only the actual raw materials. F for example, uh, wrought aluminium, cast aluminium, steel, stainless steel, um, it can be uh, different polymers and so on. When we have that bill of material, we match that with the, um, the data from our databases, uh, EcoInvent and um, uh, Gabi professional database. Sometimes we use other data when there is um, um, understanding that the database data is not maybe good enough. We have the internal data like I said before, which is our own operations. And then what we did, we knew from the beginning that the battery of an electric vehicle is a, uh, a major part of the carbon footprint. So we decided to make a um, more detailed life cycle assessment of the battery modules that we buy from uh, our battery suppliers. So for the battery modules, they are not included in the methodology that I just described. Uh, we work together with our suppliers to um, do more detail as say to get real data from our suppliers on the battery modules. Yeah, maybe I've mentioned some of this before, but um, these are things that we realize that many uh, car manufacturer manufacturers are not declaring when they present uh, carbon footprint results. But we have allocated for materials production and refining, we have allocated all scrap to our own vehicle, which is of course giving it a much higher carbon footprint than it, if we would have not done that. So even if it's scrap sent back to recycling, in this scenario we use the so-called cut-off uh, approach, which means that we are, all the material that we buy, even if there is scrap, we are uh, including that. Um, 
and um, most we use data sets from databases like I said so we have included also the manufacturing process of the materials of course not only the raw material itself uh, we have specified for the major materials we have specified what manufacturing processes these are for example is it a sheet is it casted uh, and so on um, we have made quite conservative assumptions in our LCA and of course that's why uh, that's because we don't want when we don't know we think that we should take a more conservative approach in the assumptions in order not to be accused of trying to make the carbon footprint look better than it might be so um, yeah it, it this is um, maybe something also that we see that we don't really know because many car manufacturers are not declaring their methodology but this might not be the case in, in every uh, carbon footprint or LCA of, of vehicles. Like I said, the battery modules, so the battery pack in an electric vehicle consists of a lot of components and it's only the cell mod modules that we buy from our battery um, um, suppliers. So for the cell modules we made a specific LCA, but all the other components of the battery, you can see them in the list there, they are included in the more uh, generic um, methodology that I told you about and for those we have used data sets from databases. Um, manufacturing logistics, of course, there we can get good data because these are operations that we have control over. In, at least in the Geely group. We are part of the, maybe I should mention that, we are part of the Geely group, so we are owned by Geely and Volvo Cars. Um, so Polestar 2 is produced in a Geely factory in Luqiao, China. Um, so we can get specific data from them, of course, uh, both on electricity use, heat use, fuels, also scrap, I haven't put that there, but scrap rates, they are also stamping steel sheets there. Um, and also we get from Volvo cars who are operating the logistics for us in this, uh, when it comes to Polestar 2, they have given us data on uh, the emissions from uh, the, um, the logistics. Um, in the use phase then, we chose to use 200,000 kilometers, like I said. Doesn't mean that the Polestar 2 cannot drive longer than that during its lifetime. It Probably it can drive much longer than that, but we had to choose something. Um, and we used v, uh, WLTP data for the use phase. And yeah, there have, I can imagine there are some critics to that, but we don't really have so much choice because there are so many different... Okay, WLTP is a certification for vehicles on um, emissions and uh, for electric vehicles on um, energy use, I should mention that. Uh, and it might not always be real world data, as we say, but there are so many different driving patterns. Uh, so we had to choose something standardized basically for this study. And what we include is, of course, the emission the, the for the Polestar 2, we include emissions from the electrici electricity production and the tailpipe emissions, of course, are zero. We, ca we have a comparison car. I haven't mentioned that. <laughs> we have a comparison car from Volvo that we use, the XC40 in, in a combustion engine car. Use for, it uses petrol then as a fuel. Uh, and uh, for that one, of course, the production of the fuel and the tailpipe emissions are both included. So that's about the methodology. I didn't mention uh, every detail, but uh, we have some Q&A later. You can ask me any questions you want. Uh, the results then, so what you can see here is uh, four different um, uh, bars and the first one is uh, to the left is the Volvo XC40 ICE um, result and the black part is the manufacturing of and the refining of um, all the raw materials and components. Then you have the grey part which is manufacturing uh, of the actual car, putting the car together the white part is the use phase and then the little part on the top is the end of life. And of course, uh, the um, 
combustion engine car has a lot of emissions from the use phase, we all know that. For the Polestar 2 then we have three scenarios, one with a global average energy mix, one with a European average and one with wind power to show uh, that it makes a lot of difference what you charge your car with. Um, I mean in all of the three scenarios the Polestar comes out better than the um, Volvo XC40 but of course the, if you use a global average mix you are quite close uh, so that's good to remember. Um, the yellow part is the battery modules so that's uh, a big contributor to the carbon footprint of the Polestar 2. Um, what we want to show also here is that in a, in a future when we have more, more and more renewable energy the emissions the, from the Polestar 2 will go down and there is a great potential for an electric vehicle to have much lower emissions than a, a combustion engine car. But we also want to say that we know that we have to work also on the use phase to make a more efficient car and to make it possible for customers to use green electricity. This uh, picture shows what we call a break-even curve. I think it's quite common when you compare, um, a, for example, in this case, case, a petrol car with an electric vehicle. And um, the orange line then is uh, the um, petrol car. And as you can see, it starts uh, on the level of, its. I think it's about 18 tons CO2 equivalents. That's the all the emissions from production, manufacturing and also end of life. And you can see that the all, all the other lines, which are the Polestar 2 scenarios, they start on a higher level. So the uh, emissions, of course, from production and manufacturing are higher for the Polestar 2. Then the orange line will continuously increase because of the emissions in the use phase. So that's when you drive the car, you can see on the x-axis the kilometers driven. And for the electric vehicle, you see that um, depending then on what electricity mix you use, you will cross the orange line at different um, points. And um, this is also um, to show that uh, after about 50,000 kilometers, then the, if you drive on the wind power, the Polestar 2 will be, um, have less emissions than um, than uh, the the petrol car, and yeah, we uh, if and of course if we can uh, drive on more green electricity, uh, and if for example we can make the car more energy efficient, the, this point will the cross crossing between the lines will uh, occur earlier. I wanted to show this as well. It this is a breakdown of the different materials that we have in the car. So this only represents the uh, materials production and refining uh, that we call it uh, and how much they contribute to the carbon footprint. Uh, so aluminium is a big contributor both due to the high, I mean we produce in China uh, and uh, so we have and there is a lot of uh, electricity going into aluminium production as well as some scrap, uh, so that comes out as a high contributor. The battery modules, of course, steel and iron, also uh, due to um, uh, emissions in the production, of course, in, um, there are actually direct emissions from, from the actual uh, production of uh, steel, and also scrap rates. Electronics came out as a big contributor. We weren't really aware of that it would be that big, so that's something that we have to work on in the future to get more understanding. This might be a, this is probably a field where we have uh, less knowledge than the other ones on how, what can we actually do here. The value chains are very complicated. Then you have polymers, fluids, glass and tires and so on. And what we want to sh show with this is that car manufacturers many times focus on polymers, recycling of polymers, um, biopolymers. Nothing wrong with that, but we have to address those big three, we can say, <laughs> aluminium, steel and battery modules. 
if we want to make a real change in, uh, in our environmental impact. That was my presentation. Um, I also included the link to uh, our LCA report. And uh, now uh, you are free to ask me questions. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Very excellent presentation. And so now for the attendees, now I have uh, unmuted all of you. If you any of you have any questions, either you can just uh, you know, unmute your mic and, and ask. Uh, otherwise, you can also raise it in your question panel. Then I can ask it for, for you. So, yeah. so any of you First have of any course. questions? Yeah, yeah, this is Badri here, Badri Nath from uh, Grunfos. Uh, I have a very, uh, thank you very much, Lisa. It's really interesting that actually it's a quite a bit of work. I fully understand because I myself has gone through some of the things. And my first question is, yes, I do agree. First, before the question, the comment, I do agree. ISO standard doesn't mention actually what methodology needs to be used. And uh, I do agree that actually there are specific category rules that needs to be used in order to use the validation methodologies. Coming to the LCA databases, you have mentioned some of the LCA databases. How you are you're directly bringing in this? Can I ask the question on that perspective? In your slide, you have mentioned actually the boundaries and the flow, how you are showing. In that, the LCA databases you have mentioned, how those uh, and how much of the generic data has been used in this specific analysis? You mean in the specific analysis of the yeah. of the whole car or? Uh, wherever it is, how much is the percentage of generic data and how yeah. much is actually the actual data? <clears throat> okay, yeah, you can ask that. So this was the first LCA that we, um, we have done as a company. So the main focus for this LCA was to develop a methodology that we can, so that we can produce uh, carbon footprints for all our cars, as we have promised. Uh, so the big work that we have going forward is to get supplier specific data for those big um, uh, parts of the pie chart that I showed you. Um, so we have almost, I would say, for all raw materials, we have um, uh, coming into our factory, we have generic data, except for the battery modules. I will come back to it. Um, the only thing that we know is the things that's happening in our own factory. So there's some scrap rates and so on happening there. For the battery modules, our, our um, suppliers LG Chem and uh, CATL has uh, given us data on the energy use, um, efficiency and the scrap and so on. I mean, this type of data from their manufacturers. We have also received some spe specific data from tier two suppliers uh, to the battery um, uh, manufacturers, uh, but uh, not full inventory from, absolutely not. So, I mean, uh, the, the big part of the data is generic data. Okay. The second question actually on the same, why only XC40 ICE has been taken for comparison? Because you also have another model, ICE plug-in hybrid. Yes. So uh, what it, makes sense? This, yeah, why? This project, yeah, it's a good question. This project was um, a co collaboration with Volvo. And um, we, we, the XC40 IC was um, um, done basically by them using the exact same methodology as we are. Uh, so, but they basically made the choice of what car they want to use. And I think uh, in the few months to come, it will be very clear why they chose that car. <laughs> I can't say more than that. <laughs> yes, they yeah. do have the plug in okay. hybrid. Why it is not used? That's the more, that's the only question which I have. Sorry? Thank you very much. Okay. They do have a plug-in hybrid. They do have a lot of plug-in hybrids, but they haven't done LCAs of them yet, at least. Okay. So the yeah. question now is actually they don't have the LCA on the plug-in hybrids. No, uh, may, they might have internally. I can't answer that, but not they haven't uh, published it at least. Okay. Thank you. Any 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 other questions from the audience? Yeah, I have a question. Um, this uh, is Gwendolyn. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm uh, Gwendolyn Bailey. I'm an advisory board member uh, on the RIA. Um, and I also have a background in, in LCA. Um, so I wanted to ask a few questions. I don't know if we have time, but uh, my main question is um, your results basically showed that, uh, which is very similar to LCAs I've done as well, that the energy or the use phase was the, the, one of the biggest contributor in terms of uh, impacts of CO2. And you said that a result of that is that you will work on making the yeah, the, pol the next is edition of the Polestar or whatever more energy efficient. But in the scenario with using 100% wind power, um, what is the reason for making um, a more energy efficient um, a vehicle when your your energy is renewable? Well, the reason for that is that well, the customer pays for electricity even if it's renewable, so they want mm -hmm. to charge less. And also, mm -hmm. one of the biggest sale what do you call it, arguments or like for our customers or important for our customers is range. So, I mean, if the car okay. is more efficient, you can increase range. So there is a big push to make our electric vehicles more efficient, even without the environmental aspect to it. Okay, so then it's more kind of a commercial commercial reasons after that than, than not, so, not such environmental reasons after that. Yes. Okay. Um, and then you also spoke about like um, the the data sources is similar to Badri's question. Um, you're using a mix of EcoInvent and Gabi and some other kind of more generic data. But I wonder how you deal with that in your in the scope of your LCA because usually according to ISO, okay, we're not all <laughs> on board with ISO, but um, according to ISO, you can't. I mean, it's not very um, good practice at least um, to mix different um, databases together because they all have different cutoffs, allocation rules, and it could be um, leading to erroneous results. Do you have any um, mitigation measures that you used on that to help prevent that? Well, we do, we, we, we usually, when we use uh, database data, we assess all the data that we have. Like if we have uh, several data sets for the same material, we look into them and see, are there major differences between them? Uh, and um, so we do what can we, can we can we say like some analysis of the data um, mm -hmm. we can't really use only one database there is just not they are not that complete um, yeah I understand. but um, yeah so we try to um, if you have done LCA you know that there is a problem with transparency in the data mm -hmm. sets sometimes mm -hmm. but yeah, as for now we are mixing and yeah, there might be problems with it, but we try to at least, if we have four data sets for a material and one is very much an outlier, we try to, we try to investigate why is, the, why is it like that. We have a lot of uh, okay. direct communication with EcoInvent and, uh, and Svera as they are called now. Okay, sorry, just one last question, a good answer though. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you balance um, data confidentiality with your suppliers? Um, because as you said that they gave you information on scrap rates and you know certain manufacturing data, but they didn't give you like a full inventory. Um, and I was just wanting to know in the future, how are you gonna grapple with that um, if you're only able to get you know kind of minimalistic data? Our tier one suppliers will give us full information of their energy use and what's in their product and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, if, and sometimes they, and we, they are now, for example, at least battery suppliers, they are high, they are, they have LCA teams. So they hire, they are hiring now because I mean, all car manufacturers, manufacturers are asking those questions. And uh, we put in our, some of our contracts that they are obliged to give us. Inventory. Interesting, okay. I have a question, sorry, Lucas from Rare Earth Advisory. Um, thanks, Lisa, for, for the presentation. Uh, maybe I was uh, willing to jump back on the uh, EC new battery regulation, which essentially is asking for mandatory CO2 footprint and uh, due diligence, which would extend to um, uh, ESG certification of your suppliers. We understand that uh, you're trying to have uh, uh, more transparency from, from them. Uh, but from the, the great LCA report you were making, it looked to me that the battery part of the CO2 footprint was a, a bit like a black box. Uh, yeah. And therefore, uh, my question is, uh, what do you think is needed uh, in order to make this uh, part a lot uh, more transparent and therefore better standard 
uh, for anyone to judge the real EV impact from a CO2 standpoint? I think um, there, there needs to be, it's good for actually that it's coming uh, standards from both China and EU on it, or like uh, demands that we have to make carbon footprints of batteries because then maybe there will be more standardized way of doing it. I would say that uh, because um, if, if, our, if our suppliers have a very standardized way of reporting the data and uh, how to, to do the, the LCA uh, of their products, uh, then I think they will be more confident on dis disclosing more information. So that might be a, a reason. Uh, we are working to now ourselves to, to harmonize exactly how they calculate, but at this point we can't publish them because um, it, it it will um how to say we it it's not really fair to them to to publish it as it is now i think but it would be great with a standard that where they can um, so we have exact uh, methodology yeah and and who uh, do you think could establish this standard because uh, i mean i'm trying to discuss with a number of uh, lca uh, specialists on the upstream part of the the mining chain and mm. uh, as you say, it's a bit of a jungle. The ISO uh, framework is very uh, sketchy and therefore you end up with a very uh, conflicting, maybe sometimes LCA reports and conclusions, which makes the whole thing uh, uh, difficult to compare and uh, actually use in the end. Mm. Yeah, we have been, uh, we have put enormous amount of time in uh, talking to our battery suppliers and uh, uh, making them change a lot of in their <laughs> LCAs or how to say, so I understand what you mean. Um, I, I would say that, um, of course, the battery suppliers themselves had have to put in work into to to standardize their methodology for their products as well as we do for the cars. Okay, and maybe one final one. When I look at the extent of the material, the impact on your CO2 footprint, and the fact that uh, it essentially comes from the fact that uh, the cars are manufactured uh, in China. Don't you think that the best way to uh, uh, decrease this, maybe half it, uh, would be to reshore the production of these cars into Europe? Yeah, one, one might think that, but at, at the same time, we are a Chinese company, so it's not really, that's very much out of my scope. <laughs> Look, your answer, you know, who make the standard? That's what exactly we at RIA doing that, at least for the rare earth and magnet motors, we are trying to do that. One question actually coming to the results part. In the first slides, you mentioned that you have considered the modularity and the circular economy perspectives, but when it comes to the results, you have showed that the steel and aluminium contribution of the carbon footprint is pretty high. So that means that you have not considered the, these two aspects during your analysis? Yes, we have not, because we use the cutoff approach. This is a big discussion now on, in the uh, vehicle industry. What type of end of life approach is supposed to be used? And I said, we, so we had a cutoff approach now, which means that when uh, we are buying, uh, recycled materials we we take the carbon footprint of recycled material so it's basically lower than than uh, than virgin material but in the end of life case we cannot take credit for recycling of the material if that's answering to your question but uh, so so and that also means that um, we are looking into the scrap question because it might be too conservative to include the uh, uh, in not take any credit for the scrap being sent back to, because it's a, it's not sent back into the like general waste management system is is usually sent back directly to a to a producer so yeah that might be something we will change in the thank you lisa for an excellent presentation and wonderful answers to the all the questions now we'll move to the to the next presenter i invite professor lu wang who is from exactly you know from baoto and inner mongolia professor lu wang hello everyone i'm lu wang from china nice to meet you thanks to REIA for giving me this opportunity to share my study. Today, the topic I share with you is practice and the progress of a real earth element environmental governance in China. This is my workplace. The key lab is located in Baoto, 
the Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region. Let me introduce Balto briefly. Balto is located in the northernmost part of China. We know this city because it has the largest real earth mine in the world, the Bayanab mine. Actually, Bayanab is uh, it's a Mongolian pronunciation. It means a rich sacred mountain. Its true pronunciation is like this, Bayanab. And the bottle has a complete real estate industry chain from mining to application. And it's the only place with uh, four real estate industry chain in the world. Although Bato is uh, an industry city, uh, an in industrial city, and it also has a beautiful prairies. So welcome to Bato. Okay, today I've introduced four parts practice, progress, current study, and achieve the results. First, I've introduced my study, environmental impacts of scandium oxide production from real earth tailings of Bayan Abba mine. After more than half a century mining, hundreds of millions of tons of real earth tailings have been produced from Bayan Abba mine. And these tailings are stored in the tailings pond. So far, this is the world's largest real tailings pond. It's harm to the surrounding environment, of course. At present, it has stopped discharging tailings into the pond and replaced it with comprehensive utilization of the tailings. These tailings contain a lot of useful elements like this. Some elements even enrich in the tailings, such as scandium. Scandium is a key element of the third generation solid fuel cell. But the popularity of this battery is limited by scandium. The global, the global supply of scandium is few. How to get scandium with large stable supply and low environmental impact is a question. Now we find a way to solve the problem. That is extracting scandium from real earth tailings, like this slide shows. However, we don't know whether the process is environmentally friendly. So LC research is needed. In this study, we selected the production of one kilogram scandium oxide from real earth tailings as a function unit. The system binary is from real earth tailings to the scandium oxide production completion, not including transportation and the packaging. There are two major stages, the bonification stage and the smelting stage. They include five major processes and 22 sub-processes. At present, this process has already started a small scale production and will start a mass production in the future. In these processes, the iron benefication and the oxalic acid precipitation has the greatest environmental impact in the benefication stage and the smelting stage respectively. The human toxicity non-cancer is the greatest impact category. The steam and the oxalic acid contribute the most to human toxicity non-cancer. The reason is during the production of them, a lot of organic matters generated. Why human toxicity non-cancer is the main impact category? The characteristics value is not large because it has a high weight. So in LCA research, if an input will lead, a, will lead some impact categories with a high weight, it cannot be easily cut off. Not only the real earth, but also some other product have been found that the impact of human toxicity and cancer is huge, such as building materials. So we should give human toxicity and cancer more attention. 
uh, we comparing with the literature's data, we found the scandium oxide got from real earth tailings of buying up mine has a lower impact. So the buying up mine can provide a stable and environmentally friendly source of scandium for this battery. The purpose for publishing this article uh, is we want to figure out the environmental impact of the comprehensive utilization process and find out whether extracting scandium oxide from rare earth tailings is environmentally friendly and the most important is we provide a life circle inventory of scandium oxide and some important reagents such as the P507. I chose this article because this because there are many environmental problems in China's tailings ponds. I will talk about this next. And in the following presentation, I'd like to draw your attention to some time points. 2010, 2015, and 2020. They are the last year of the five-year plan of China. The five-year plan is very important in China. According to the plan, they will release a lot of policies and provide lots of funds. This plan will determine the development direction of China in the next five years. Now, China is going into the 14th five-year plan. Okay, let's talk about the tailings pond problem. There are nearly 8,000 tailings ponds in China, ranking first in the world, including hundreds of real earth tailings ponds. In 2010, China released a policy that the number of tailings ponds will only decrease but not increase and the existing tailings ponds do not expand their capacity. The result is if companies want to continue running, they must solve the problem of the tailings first. Otherwise, production will stop. Before this policy, Bayan Obama has begun to solve the problem and the environment of tailings ponds has been treated. We can see the remote sensing picture. Remote sensing picture. In 2010, by Yang Boman tailings pond will still in use. In 2020, this pond has been closed. After treating, the waste water has reduced. We can see the waste water, waste water reduced. Look at the two pictures below. The present environment has been suitable for birds to live. This situation will keep back getting better. Of course, when we use tailings, we cannot make pollution transfer. So we need to do LCA research like I did before. The next progress is from 2010 to 2020. China releases many policies and provides funds for ecological recovery of rare earth mines. Look at the three remote sensing pictures before mining, mining and after mining recovery. This is an iron adsorption real earth mine in southern China. In 2000, 2010, mining destroyed the environment. In 2020, the damaged area has been recovered. The three picture below this three picture show the improvement of the damaged rear earth mining area. So we can see the policies work. The next important policy is the government integrated hundreds of enterprises into six and implement mining and separation quarters, mining quarters and separation quarters. This is a response to China's long-standing problem with the illegal rare earth mining. The illegal, real, illegal mining 
has caused many problems to environment. In this part, uh, Professor Nabil and some other experts did a great job. Besides the major policies mentioned above, many other real earth element policies have been released. This slide shows various real earth and environmental policies in China. We can see many policies have been released since 2010, that time point. This slide shows the number of real earth standards each year in China. We can see the quantity has increased since 2009. 2009. Increase. Most of them involve some environmental contents. The left picture is an LCA standard on centered neodymium or iron boron magnetic material. The right picture is an LC report. I joined in the compilation both and, the re and this report, this report has passed uh, by SGS uh, certification. Okay, we just uh, seen many real earth environmental policies in China since 2010. Some experts, some experts can be seen and others cannot. So we use a method of combining remote sensing technology and GIS to study the whole effect of these policies. Uh, let's take Bayan of Mine as an example. We know China released many real earth environmental policies since 2010. We can see the ecological loss reach an inflection point between 2010 and 2012. Why the inflection point is not in 2010? Because after releasing this policy, it may take some time to, to work. And we can see the decline rate. We can see the decline rate has accelerated since 2015. So that's why uh, I want to pay attention to the three time point, 2010, 2015, 2020. Because a lot of policies are released since 2010. So in China, Policy play an important role in improving the environment. Yeah. Next, I will introduce my current study. The first is a comparative LCA of neodymium magnet recycling processes. We use the life cycle assessment method to do this work. Second is comparative LCA of induction motors and uh, permanent uh, magnet motors, the two motors. We use life cycle assessment to, uh, to see the environmental uh, impact. The third is ecological loss of rare earth mines in China that I mentioned above. We use the remote, remote sensing technology and the GIS. Okay, so next, I will introduce some achieved results of mine and my research team. This is a life circle inventory database of real earth, including some important reagents such as uh, P507, uh, that's not in eco event. And we made some LCA standards and uh, some reports I mentioned uh, just now. The last one is a small LCA program. It can do some environmental load uh, distribution. The main, principle, the main principle is the contribution of subjective and objective weights. Actually, we call we call it software. Okay. Finally, let's talk about the latest news. 
the Chang'e 5 probe had brought a moon sample back to Earth. It has landed in Inner Mongolia today. After some time, we will know whether the moon contains real Earth and how many, of course. Uh, that's all my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Professor Lu Wang. Very interesting presentation and a good perspective on how China is implementing environmental standards. So I open the floor for questions. As said, either you can directly ask the questions or you can type in the question panel. So any questions, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I am uh, from University of Arizona. I have a question regarding the REE database, uh, REBD. How can we access it? Uh, this uh, this database, including some important uh, regions, such as the uh, flotation region, uh, extraction region, and uh, others. Uh, this region uh, are not in the eco event uh, database. Uh, uh, in my work, sometimes we will use this uh, region uh, to do the LCA, but it's not in the eco event, so we must uh, uh, build it uh, by ourselves. That's why I. So, so that's why mean, we build this uh, database. So, so it's not available for the public. We will have. Uh, we will make this uh, database um, by ourselves, and uh, maybe we will uh, release some non-confidential data in the future. Any any other questions, please? What is the base for the CAGP standard? What's the fundamental? Oh, yeah. It's a kind of uh, standards, uh, maybe called group standards. Some some company and enterprises will build these standards. It's not the, the national standards, just the group standards. But what uh, it's on what basis? What is the fundamental for this? How how your life cycle assessment? You said actually CAGP life cycle assessment specification. So what is yeah. the basic? What's the methodologies and how you are assessing this? And what are the what are the aspects around it? Yeah, the the method is life cycle assessment, of course. Um, it's not uh, some data in the in the CAGP. It's just a specification, just the, uh, just the read how to do the life cycle assessment of the of the magnetic material. It's not including uh, the data. Just the method. Yeah, what what's what's that actually you are appro approaching? What is your assessment method? Mm. Method. Yeah, life cycle assessment. Yeah, let's ask actually in a straightforward. What is the outcome of your carbon footprint actually if you say per kilo of sintered neodymium? Uh, the the detail method. Uh, no, I don't need any method actually. I just want to know actually what is your outcome of this assessment per kilo of sintered neodymium? What is your carbon footprint? Uh, hello? Yeah, yeah I happen. Yeah, please. Uh, 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 sorry for interrupt. Uh, actually, uh, this standard is a net uh, a standard for the eco design of the process and the product. So it doesn't include any uh, like. Uh, uh, numerical result is just a standard for the uh, I, I mean the company any company uh, to conduct and they can get their own result based on this standard it's just uh, like a you know um mathematical uh uh per process for the conduct eco design for the different product and uh, we, we are a group and uh, we we just uh, uh i mean to give the standard uh process for them to conduct this uh, eco design uh, process. Uh, I don't know yeah. whether it's clear or not. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a kind of framework for yeah, the. I, I, think, I think yeah, you 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 can download the free uh, through internet if you can tap this name and you can download 
uh, and I think it's basically in Chinese as uh, several uh, abstract English, but you, you can free to translate. Yeah. Okay. Any any other questions? Yeah, maybe one. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Wang. Uh, maybe, a, uh, I don't know, a naive question, but uh, given all the uh, improvement you highlight uh, from the ecological loss and the number of uh, variables you highlight, don't you think that uh, the best would be maybe to make uh, some of these data a lot more available in order to uh, let's say, uh, offset the kind of, uh, you know, negative reputational uh, risk uh, rare earth elements carries uh, in the Western uh, countries? Uh, sometimes the way we uh, collect uh, the different companies' data. And uh, maybe, maybe this will make, the, make our re results uh, 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 right for right and uh, sometimes uh, the, the companies uh, are not provide uh, many data and but we try to ask them to collect the many data for our study and uh, for uh, for reduce the risks for the for our study results any any other questions? Uh, I have a question regarding the scandium production rate. So currently, global production is very limited, like ten tons a year. Um, how much bioenoble? You mentioned small scale. Could you reveal how much is that, or do you have a plan for certain capacity target? Yeah, your size scandium uh, maybe in Bayanable is a, uh, I said uh, it's uh, now it's a little little production, not mass production, maybe one ten a year. In the future, maybe ten tens a year. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, you said that SGS has certified. On what basis, actually, SGS has certified this? What's the fundamental? Do you frame any category rules for this, or SGS has just certified by looking at what you have done? Uh, it's just that the life cycle assessment fr uh, framework. Framework. Uh, the SGS will. Uh, the SGS will 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 see our. Uh, result and uh, they will just uh, right or wrong uh, what we did. The they they basically the the air, uh, life cycle assessment. Uh, yeah, that's that's our uh, that's just our result, and maybe just the two reports passed by the SGS certification and uh, some standards uh, in the future we will do more uh, work to to make make our results without uh... yeah thank you any other questions couple of or uh, i have a question so uh, yeah. you say that you're trying to produce candium from the tailings but are there uh, any other rare earth elements that um, are in the tailings that have potential and maybe they have also like a high volume use uh, right now in the market that maybe could be also extracted from the tailings? Yeah, uh, the scandium from the rare earth tailings, uh, not just the one element, and uh, others is iron rare earth element and uh, neodymium and uh, yeah like this oh i'm um, sorry yeah um wouldn't it be more interesting to also try for neodymium especially that it's uh in high demand um uh, the, the 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 supply of the scandium is few in the in the world 
but but in Bayan my uh, in the tailings it has it, it enriched in the in the tailings. So if um, if we use uh, we comprehensive utilization of the tailings uh, extract extracting the scandium from the tailings, we will got a lot of and uh, we will solve the problem uh, and provide provide the stable and uh, the supply of the of the scandium to the uh, battery. Thank you, okay. Professor Luang, and thank you all for the questions and 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 answers. And now we will move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, next person is Professor Shinichiro Morimoto from AIST Japan. And he will make a presentation on the substance flow analysis and, and end of like electronics. Professor Morimoto, floor is yours. My name is Shinichiro Morimoto. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a long name. Uh, and I'm from the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, Japan. Uh, now, uh, for those who ever never heard of AIST, uh, AIST is uh, you know, one of the biggest public research institute in Japan, uh, aiming for applied research. And uh, I belong to this uh, global zero emission research center. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, the director of the center is uh, uh, Professor uh, Yoshino. He got the Nobel Prize last year for the Richelieu of that piece. So I'm um, I'm, the, I'm one of the team leader uh, belong to his center. Now the title of my presentation today is Substance Flow Analysis of Rare Art and Contribution of International Standard for its recycle from end of life product. So I have done the case study with the Neogeum. And the first, I would like to apologize that uh, my uh, my presentation do not focus so much about LCA. I work for LCA, but uh, today I, uh, <clears throat> my presentation is about recycle, uh, substance flow analysis, future forecast, and uh, economical evaluation. Now, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So the rare, uh, so the rare art is it's known as a key element for industrial development, and uh, it is increasing rapidly. And this uh, shows the demand of rare art element. And about in 2019, about 160,000 of uh, arbitral tons per year rare art have demanded. Now, if you look on this each usage, the magnet uh, has been the major usage among all. And usually it is used as a high uh, rare earth magnet used in high efficient motors. Uh, uh, for instance, like motors in hybrid electrical vehicles, wind turbines, uh, motors in air conditioner, uh, like in home appliances, uh, voice coil motor in hard disk drive. So, and uh, especially uh, in this magnet, Nelgium, as with the main, uh, is major element in the magnets rail art. And so it is rapidly increasing right now. So the uh, recycling neogen from the end of life product, the magnets, crucial challenge right now. But uh, in reality, uh, recycling rail art from end of life product is not widely commercialized now. Now, to solve this problem, uh, Several international standards are now in discussion. Uh, this is one of the ISOs I working now with uh, President Delby. And uh, this is ISO TC298. And, uh, and it has been started from 2015. So uh, I made this from the ISO website. And it is about vocabulary. It's about element recycling. It's about packaging and labeling and also measuring measurement method for, uh, <clears throat> for the magnet scraps. Now already, uh, it has started it uh, and uh, it's working for five years and three documents have published. Now. And uh, next example is the IEC standard. And uh, I don't work for this, but uh, it's very let's say, important uh, IEC, I, uh, the IEC standard right now for the recycle. 
and it has started from 2012, and it's about the material degradation. So exchange information among, among the material makers, device makers, and the final product makers to exchange information about compliance information, composition uh, element information within these uh, stakeholders. Now, <clears throat> it has started uh, from 2012, and uh, already a uh, second edition has published. And I think this year, uh, the new, uh, new edition was published, which includes the critical raw materials. So uh, right now, also already the website has been opened. So and uh, <clears throat> so it's uh, these two IEC and the ISO standards is very important ISO standard right now to enhance recycle. Now considering this background, uh, well, <clears throat> I evaluated the neogen recycle uh, from two perspectives. One is a substance flow analysis. Another is cost estimation of the recycle. So uh, what I'm thinking uh, when I work with the ISO standard is I always be anxious about what is really necessary for the sustainability beyond the scope of international standard. Now I have done this case study with the Neogeum, so I figure out what will happen by material degradation. Does it really contribute to, uh, to the recycle? If it is, then how does the standard influence the waste management? And does it really contribute to supply demand imbalance in the future? So I evaluated uh, these from two perspectives. So the purpose of my study is to evaluate the influence of international, uh, international standard in very precise amount and how does the neogen material recycle will be in the future. Uh, one of my study is the domestic substance flow analysis and also global substance flow analysis in Neogeo in Japan in the global. So what is the composition of final product in the waste flow? So how much Neogeo is discarded as final product or reused or recycled or disposed? The second, my, uh, my second study is the future demand or waste forecast of Neogeo until 2050. So how does the demand or waste will increase in the future until 2050. So what will be the major product for the recycle? And what will be the composition of final product in the waste flow? My third study is economical evaluation and LCA of material recycle from end of life product. So does the material recycle of Nilgium, uh, can be economical, feasible in the future? And if it is, then when? So what will be the influence of international standard in the recycle cost? So how much CO2 can be reduced by the Neogen recycle? So uh, this is three studies I have done with the, uh, with the Neogen. And uh, I will show you, so the methodology. So how did I did the substance flow analysis and uh, material flow analysis and the future forecast? So the first thing is I have done, I have made this original database of material, uh, mineral resource contained rate on each equipment, each type of equipment, each performance of equipment, and uh, not just each equipment in each materials. So what will the correlation uh, will be between the performance of, and the rate of the uh, of mineral resource contained rate? So I, I had this mapping. So what will the contained rate will be in the future? So I, uh, and also by multiplying, the production sales, export, or import, I have done this original substance flow analysis with the bottom-up approach. So I have done a lot of, a lot of interviews between the many, uh, many companies. I, I have, uh, for some uh, of the elements of some of the product, there is no uh, number of production and sales. I have done this uh, simulation and uh, of course there is very big uncertainty. So I have done this kind of Monte Carlo simulation to evaluate how much uncertainty, uh, uncertainty uh, will be uh, in the, each product. And by multiplying the future uh, forecast demand, I am making the low carbon scenario. So uh, what will be the new challenge for the recycle or for the, or for the alternative materials or for the mineral uh, supply potential? Now, uh, this is one of the results uh, or examples I have done 
about global substantial analysis of mildew. Now, this, is, this indicates each uh, stage from mining to the alloy production, mandate production, production of final product, and the demand. And from in each area, China, Japan, and rest of the, uh, rest of the countries. Now, about the nail this amount is, uh, is mined in China, and this amount in the rest of the world in 2016. Now, when it goes to alloy, this is the amount uh, which China can produce as alloy. And this is the amount of uh, Japan. This is the amount of the rest of the countries. So we will distribute uh, <clears throat> among the world as a magnet for final application and uh, production to the demand. And uh, what I focus on, this is black bar, indicates, the, I say, unofficial, unofficial Nelgium which means the illegal mining. So uh, I was very surprised of this estimation, but it was true that about this is amount uh, of the illegal mining was produced in this uh, 2016 uh, in China. So this amount, this amount of illegal mining will be distributed among the world uh, by the import and export and to the demand. So, uh, of course, there is very big RCTP. So I did a, some kind of Monte Carlo simulation of how much RCTP is in each final product in each area. This is the result of the, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the evaluation in China. This is uh, the result of the rest of the countries. So this graph indicates that about for the like SUVs, uh, for the uh, motorbikes, about 25% of Nelgium is from illegal mining. And in the rest of the country, this is the amount. So this, this, uh, this height shows the uh, appearance rate. So this 25% uh, is illegal mining. And however, about uh, this, is, this height shows uh, uncertainty. So if this is very high, it indicates that this uncertainty is very low. So like VCMs, it's uh, uncertainty is very high, XV is very low, and from this result, about 25 to 26 percent of the neogen was uh, contained uh, from illegal mining in 2016. Now China has recently uh, has uh, strictly, strictly restricted this illegal mining within these few years, and as the result. Many of the uh, Chinese uh, magnet makers uh, had a problem show, uh, about the supply problem of the Nelgen because of the illegal mining has really decreased. And so to that end, uh, China has, uh, <clears throat> has imported a rare art from Myanmar. So this is one of the results why Myanmar had started to produce rare art from 2018. So I say uh, from this, this is the data of USGS, but I, my assumption is that uh, this, the USA and Myanmar started to produce rare earths, and so rare earths seems to increasing, the production seems to be increasing, so, but uh, from my assumption, it's not increasing, it's coming closer to the reality. So this is one of the results I got from substance flow analysis from the, uh, in the globally. And this is another example I done the substance analysis of Nelgium in Japan. So uh, in Japan, the rare earth, uh, rare earth elements is mined in China and it was electrolyzed and imported to Japan and alloy dissolves, jet milling, pressed, and finally by sintering coating about nearly two, uh, 3,000 Nelgium was contained as a Nelgium magnet in, uh, domestically in 2018. So uh, this, this rent shows the, the amount of Nelgium contained in each final product. So this length also shows, uh, this length also shows the amount of the waste uh, from each final product in 2018. So about 30% of the consumption is has been wasted in each year as uh, as the waste. 
And this the green part shows a waste flow. So this is the amount of uh, weight plus uh, uh, about, about this amount shows the neogen which is goes to collectors uh, when they got wasted. And because the very advanced recycling laws and restrictions, uh, about 30% of the, uh, the waste uh, waste flow goes will be re uh, reused either in domestically or in globally. So the part uh, of the reuse uh, product goes to overseas and it goes to this and this, this amount goes to, uh, to oversee as a scrap. So at the end, this is the amount which goes to EOS scrap domestically. And please look at this graph, which shows the rate of final application in, uh, in the amount which goes to this from collectors. So XCB's air conditioners have described, it's pretty easy to dismantle a motor from the final product. But if you look at these other industrial motors or wind turbines or conventional car motors, it's, uh, it is very difficult to dismantle. So this is 64% total is the amount which international standards can contribute to enhance the recycle from, uh, from the final product. So <clears throat> uh, next I have done the future forecast of production, sales, and export. Now, um, uh, so I have estimated the future production, sales, and export and vehicle by, uh, by the very simple equation like this. So I estimated production by adding domestic sales and uh, domestic sales and the number of export. And the number of uh, number of domestic sales is uh, is uh, estimated by the uh, number of owned vehicles and the waste using the logic model and the wider distribution. And also the number of export is estimated by the total export to 17 countries from Japan to overseas. And the multiple regression model is applied by using the population and GDP per capita as uh, exponential variables. Now, uh, this is the one of the results I have estimated about the production, sales, and export. So this yellow part is domestic sales. Now it will decline until 2050 by the population decrease. And but export will increase uh, to the uh, 17 countries of the world. And as a total, production of vehicle uh, increased a little until 2050, but remains also uh, remains almost the same. And by applying this production sales and export, uh, one of the factors which uh, rare earth element will increase is uh, future mobility electrification. So this is a uh, this is a, one of the uh, data I got from about the mobility electrification. So uh, if you see in the fig uh, figure six, this is the rate of XCBs in new sales. So most of the like uh, uh, think tanks, uh, the Ministry of uh, the government, uh, this is Boston uh, Boston Consulting Group, had forecasted about 50% uh, of the new sale must be XEVs until, until 2040. Now, almost all forecast reveals uh, uh, here, uh, the rate of XEV must be more than 50% until, uh, until 2040. And uh, by the METI target in 2080, uh, is that more than 50 to 70 percent of the uh, new sales of the vehicle must be uh, XCBs in 2030. Now, uh, recently, uh, our, our Prime Minister Suga had announced that uh, uh, we have we, <clears throat> we, uh, the CO2, uh, CO2 emission in 2050 must be zero. And uh, so we have uh, more strict target until 2030, but using this METI target, I have forecasted Neogen demand until, to, until 2050. Now each color shows each uh, final product. Uh, this pink is the conventional car motors. This is the motors of the XEVs. This is uh, the green part is air conditioners, the washing machines, the refrigerators, 
Thus, yellow is a hard disk drive. Uh, this is uh, wind turbine and other industrial models. So if you see on this graph, the XEVs will be the main uh, usage of the increasement of the uh, energy demand in the future. And also, uh, these other industrial models in the green part, uh, this is another reason why energy demand will increase in the future. So, uh, <clears throat> if you see uh, this uh, conclusion about sort of 4,000 to 50,000 uh, 5, uh, 5, 5, tons per year of energy will be demanded into the, until 2050, and 31% uh, uh, is from XEVs and 21% is from industrial models. So, this, this is a target. Uh, uh, well, for the recycle uh, and <clears throat> by, the uh, by the contribution of international standard. Now, my third study is economical evaluation of neogen recycle. Now, I had uh, estimated the uh, neogen recycle cost by adding the facility cost and transportation cost. So, facility cost will increase by the number of, by the increase of the number of recycle facility. Now, in this meeting, the recycle facility means a smelting facility or a purification facilities. So, however, by the increase of the number of recycle facilities, the transportation cost will decrease. So, I thought, so there is an optimal number of recycle facilities considering the cost of transportation and the uh, facility cost. So this optimization was done by location looting model, which I have uh, created. So the future waste and the future location of the recycle facilities. So how much the recycle cost will be in the future and also how much the benefit will be the recycle business were estimated using this model. And this is the uh, equation I have used for this model. And uh, I, it's, Pretty difficult, but um, the maximum, so ultimate uh, maximum benefit was estimated by this location routing uh, routing model, and this is the transportation cost, the facility cost, and the labor cost. So total benefit subtracted by the transportation facility uh, and the labor cost is estimated by this model, and the maximum, the optimization number of the recycling facility was estimated by this equation. And this is the result of my estimation. So about five locations were selected by the, uh, by the result of the optimization. So this each prefecture is a place where recycle facility must be located in 2014. And this color indicates the, the, the area which, uh, which nailed, uh, the motor must be collected into one prefecture. So uh, recycle facility locates in the uh, center of the high population density area, and the recycle cost was estimated to be about 120 US dollars per kilogram of neogen in 2020. It will decrease to 116 dollars per kilogram in 2040. And this is the cost pro uh, proportion of neogen recycle. About 38% was a labor cost. So uh, by, uh, by international standard, which will uh, enhance the recycle by the material degradation, uh, this labor cost can be decreased. So in the future, this $116 can be reduced by S38% by the national standard. So right now, about Nelgium price is about from $9,200 uh, per kilogram. So in the future, it, uh, this recycling business can be feasible in 2000, about 2000, from 2013 to 2014. So this is the evaluation, uh, evaluation of energy recycle business in the future. So uh, with the uh, different recycling rate. So uh, the, uh, the, the benefit, the profit of the business will be about uh, 20 to 100 million US dollars per year in until 2014. So uh, this I have evaluated with a different discount rate and uh, also different recycling date. And we have a maximum is about uh, 100 to 120 million US dollars per uh, million US dollars per year. Now, uh, so 
I have estimated uh, recycling neogen is will be feasible in the future, and also international standards can contribute this recycling business. But right now, in the reality, uh, this is what I got from uh, by the interview with the different stakeholders. For instance, uh, steel scrap dealer says the sorting of rare earth magnet motor is too difficult. The amount of motors per scrap is too small right now, so additional cost is necessary for the sorting. This man says the employees are not enough, even the magnet maker will buy a rare earth magnet motor. It is, it is, for them, it is more convenient to sell to neighboring scrap dealer or overseas dealer. So it is very technically difficult to dismantle motors from final product. So not just international standards, another uh, uh, technological in, uh, improvement, improvement is necessary for the recycling uh, business. Also, the alloy or magnet company says, but well, they're anxious about, does the anxious about, uh, does the demand of rare earth rarity increase in the future? So how, for, how about uh, e-fuel? Uh, does it uh, motor, uh, mobility electrification it will be really, uh, increase uh, increasing the future. They are very anxious about this. So those, those are energy price really increase in the futures. So there are too much risks to start the recycling business considering this rare earth price volatility. So this is what I got uh, uh, from each stakeholders. So in the reality. So to solve this problem, I think uh, estimating the CO2 reduction by the energy recycle is one of the solution. Uh, to enhance the energy recycle from end of life product. So I estimated this uh, CO2 reduction in the future. Uh, so this amount can be reduced uh, from 2030 to 2050 if we uh, recycle uh, energy from vehicle and the PC. But uh, if we recycle not just from vehicle and PC, from, uh, from all final product, uh, it is uh, we can reduce CO2 uh, by the maximum 3, 000, uh, 35,000 tons per year of CO2 in each year. So by using this kind of incentives uh, toward a low carbon society is one of the solution to solve the problem on energy recycle. So this is my conclusion. Uh, I have done this domestic substantial analysis, demand forecast, and cost estimation. So I found out about 25, 21% uh, is, uh, is from industrial motors uh, when, it, when I forecast the uh, forecast, uh, uh, demand of neogen in the future. So this 21% can be reduced by the contribution of international standard. Also, the 38% of recycle cost can be reduced by the uh, contribution of international standard. But in the reality, I think the cost reduction in the low carbon scenario will be necessary. Uh, in the future to enhance the recycle. Uh, and I am doing this by creating an original a database about the substance flow analysis. And I really want to have cre uh, create collaboration with uh, European or USA and with China and ASEAN countries to create a common database in the future. So uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, introduce you my studies. And uh, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Morimoto-san. Uh, a very interesting and comprehensive work. Uh, very interesting. And, and the floor is open for questions. Any questions from the audience or the panelists? Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question regarding the uh, manufacturing waste during producing the neodymium magnets. So in the literature, there are wildly different range of people numbers starting from six percent to even seventy percent and it depends on the final magnet shape were you able to quantify or make some statistics on different products and products require different shapes so that they have different manufacturing waste do you have any data on that uh, thank you for questions. I don't have data well, for the each final product, how much scrap waste or manufacturing waste it will be. However, I know uh, there is a uh, manufacturing scrap when we produce magnet. It is about, in Japan, it is about 20% uh, of the manufacturing waste will be uh, 
when we produce the uh, Neo Geo magnet. And it's 100% recycled within B2B in, the, in, uh, in Japan. Uh, the waste, the manufacturing scrap is 100% recycled in, in Japan. And it's about 20%, but I don't know actual number in each final product. What do you think is a reasonable uh, capacity for recycling neodymium magnets in a year in order to build this uh, new business? Well, um, how do I say? It? Oh, okay. The best will be, I think the first priority is from recycling from XEVs. So the maximum capacity will be about from 3% to 40% of total energy demand. But, uh, well, since the hard disk drive or wind, uh, hard disk drive or uh, home appliances demand will decrease in Japan in the future, I think the, uh, this industrial, the other industrial model, industrial model is next priority. So total about 50% is a maximum capacity, I think. Did I answer your question? Um, partially, I am more interested in, is there any some break even, like from cost perspective, we have to reach certain capacity in order to be profitable? Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, say the truth, I did cost estimation only for uh, recycling uh, neogen from XEVs, the high, uh, hybrid cars. But if you expand this uh, into the home appliances, PCs, or into other industry models, it will, uh, the cost will decrease in the future. There will be a lot of uh, feasibility. So uh, this is the, how to say, the minimum cost, I think. Only recycling from XEVs. But if we recycle from other final product, this cost will decrease much more. So it will be more feasible in Japan. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Did you run similar analysis, sorry, for uh, the, the whole uh, permanent magnets uh, chain and therefore praesodium uh, recycling uh, as well. Why did you just focus on the neodymium and not the neodymium slash praesodium, which is usually found in most magnets? Thank you. Oh, okay, well, the well, reason why I selected neodymium is because it's the main element in the, in the magnet. But uh, recycling praesodium is not in discussion right now in uh, Japan, but uh, if we do, I think this cost will much decrease uh, and the uh, recycling will be much feasible. But right now in the, some technology, uh, technically, I don't know if I can, if we can recycle procedure from Neogen Magnet. I will further ask to the, uh, some company, Magnet company. And I heard that some uh, technology in like, uh, like research phase, study phase, but I don't think it's, uh, it's realized in the commercial, uh, you know, it's commercialized in the very big capacity. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, Morimoto-san, uh, yes. you know, currently one of the highest uh, consumer of the magnets is wind energy, but in your yes. model, uh, wind energy is kind of constant. So you don't expect an increase of recycling from the wind energy? No, no, uh, please. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. This please understand this is the uh, demand in Japan. If you look into the world, that's the, the usage of the wind turbine will increase very rapidly. But uh, to say the truth, in Japan, the renewable energy will not drastically increase. Uh, it is very difficult in the situation in Japan because they're not so very big high potential for the renewable energy, especially wind turbine. So, uh, so this is why uh, wind turbine remains almost the same until 2050. But if I do this in global scale, I think the result will be much different. Yeah, yeah, that's nice, thank you. Thank you uh, for attention. And uh, I re uh, uh, by using this chance, please uh, contact me if you, uh, if we can have any collaboration. I would like to thank all the participants uh, for their contribution today. 
I think it's uh, been a very valuable and uh, learning uh, session. I would like to thank uh, Raya for organizing it. And I would like to thank all the participants for joining and asking uh, the questions. And I trust that they all have been answered uh, accordingly. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, wish you all um, uh, Merry Christmas already and a, a good turning of the year. And uh, let's hope that the uh, COVID situation will turn around quite rapidly and that we can have the next meeting in person and we can uh, share the room together with each other. Uh, for now, again, I would like to thank everybody and I would like to close this, uh, this session. Thank you.